everybody. Welcome back. It is the Break Hard Podcast. My name is Matt. We're back again to talk about what happened in NASCAR this weekend since IndyCar and Formula One were both off once again. I went to an actual race this weekend, a dirt track race, USAC non-wing sprints. We're running at Lawrenceburg. Went out there, checked it out. New track promoter this year. A lot of good things happening over there. So if you're in the area or at least in the Midwest this summer and you would like to hit up a dirt track, Lawrenceburg is maybe one of the best ones out there for sure. Right in the city essentially right next to it at least great infrastructure great in and out type of situation and like always the racing's good high banks at lawrenceburg are always entertaining high limit is there may 31st so if again you're in the area get your tickets go check it out it's definitely worth your time support your local dirt tracks and your local short tracks i'm not wearing the shirt today i have the suits hate horsepower shirt that is currently on here merch store will be up uh hopefully tonight tuesday night maybe if not, it'll be up on Wednesday. So if anybody wants one of those shirts, you can hop in there and buy them. But let's get to what happened this weekend in NASCAR. Because we headed down to Texas. Everybody's favorite 1.44 mile intermediate track. It's the smallest, biggest intermediate that we have. Or something along those lines. It is, since it's reconfiguration, IndyCar measured it out at 1.44, not 1.5 miles. Everything's not bigger in Texas, contrary to what all of those proud texans love to say um so yeah we had the cup series race on sunday and it devolved into absolute chaos it looked a lot like an extended race there at the end or a truck series race over the final part of this run of this race i think in the last 80 laps there was only one run of over so from lap 235 until lap 276 there was only one run uh, green flag run that went over 10 laps and it went 20 laps and then after that it was absolute chaos one lap green flag one lap green flag one lap green flag one lap green flag and majority of the race at the end there was run under caution we had 16 cautions for 72 laps 14 of those cautions are natural cautions two of them of course come for the stage break don't love the fact that we have to include those but whatever we'll get to that at no point ever uh chase elliott ends up winning the race back on top Everything's fine in the world of NASCAR now. 560 days later, 42 races. Chase Elliott is finally a winner again in the NASCAR Cup Series. His legion of fans. It's fitting that he won in Texas, in Dallas-Fort Worth, because his fan base is a lot like the Cowboys, except they've got to celebrate a championship in this millennium. They're irrational. They're like, ah, just a week ago, their fans were on Reddit being like, I think Hendrick Motorsports has given up on Chase Elliott. I don't think they care about Chase Elliott anymore. He's not the driver over there. Not the number one. He's not the number one. He's the number three driver at best right now, even with his win. But no, they never gave up on Chase Elliott. Chase Elliott never forgot how to drive a race car. The part that really cracks me up about this is Chase Elliott's average finish this year is 10.3. Last year, it was 13.1, which was only a half a position lower than what it was in 2022. The guy hasn't forgot how to drive a race car. He just hadn't been to victory lane yet. So he gets back to victory lane for the first time since October 2nd, 2022, when he won at Talladega. Now we're headed back to Talladega. Can he go back to back? Eh, that remains to be seen. We'll have to wait and see. I think he can, but you never know how it's going to play out here. Chase Elliott wins. Ends the Hooters uh, winless streak as well. Hooters is back in victory lane in the Cup Series for the first time since Pocono in 1992 with Alan Kowicki. So that's a great story for them. Uh, after Chase wins, apparently you get 10 free wings uh, with an order of 10 wings at Hooters. So if you're interested in that, next time he wins, that is available as well. Brad Keselowski came home in second. William Byron in third. We'll get to that in a second. Tyler Reddick fourth. Daniel Suarez in fifth as he desperately tries to maintain his job for 2025 in that 99 car. Chase Briscoe, who wrecked with Bubba Wallace, finishes sixth. Bubba Wallace, who wrecked with Chase Briscoe, finishes seventh. Austin Dillon finishes eighth. And then you have Kyle Busch who punted Carson Hosovar, he finishes ninth, and Carson Hosovar finishes 10th, his first top 10 in the NASCAR Cup Series. So if you ran into each other and you didn't actually wreck and destroy your car, chances were you're going to finish in the top 10 on Sunday because this race was absolute chaos. On the last lap of the race, we had Ross Chastain come up and try to essentially arrow block the 24 of William Byron off the corner in turn two on corner exit, and William decided to Ross Chastain, Ross Chastain didn't lift, and just drove through the one car and dumped him on the backstretch. It was a racing incident. I mean, I don't think there was any malintent from the Byron side of this, although I do think if it was somebody other than, you know, other than Ross Chastain, maybe he lifts. 
if it wasn't the last lap, maybe he lifts to let them, you know, survive another lap. But when it came down to it, Ross Chastain just got a taste of his own medicine, essentially. And I don't know if anybody actually feels that bad about it when it comes down to it at the end of the day. Ross got out of the car and he was confused. He uh, doesn't seem to think that he did anything wrong, but Ross Chastain is the one guy out there that is constantly arrow blocking every single week. He's probably the biggest, um, the most egregious when it comes down to it, the biggest perpetrator. Uh, that's a bad word to use, probably. That nah, perpetrator's fine. Um, so, yeah, I didn't have an issue with that. He goes from what would have been a second, maybe third place finish for him to end up finishing 32nd first car one lap down not great for him now i know a lot of people were like oh well he was in like third when the caution came out or fourth when the yellow came out and the field's frozen yeah except for the fact that one he brought out the caution and two did not maintain a reasonable speed and I know everybody's going to go back to what happened at Richmond when Kyle Larson got spun out by Bubba Wallace in the closing laps manages to I think maintain like sixth position is where he blended back in at which is true but he maintained that speed right he got the car going and then blended in with the rest of the field what happened with Ross is he wrecked and the whole field passed him and he didn't go so that's the biggest issue with with that other than that, we had a lot of incidents on Sunday. We had Ryan Priest just absolutely punt your defending NASCAR Cup Series champion Ryan Blaney into turn one and ruin his day for the most part. Blaney ends up finishing 33rd. Yeah, ruined his day. So that was interesting. Uh, it's really interesting considering that they're both Fords. One of those teams is sticking with Ford next year. The other one is very much more than likely not. And maybe Priest just had had enough. And granted, unfortunately, we didn't see this on the broadcast, which is something we'll get into in a minute. But we didn't see what happened prior, which apparently the 12 car drove the 41 up, ran him up the track a little bit. And then the 41 was just not happy about it and decided to just send the 12. He said, hey, buddy, you want to run up the track? Let me help you out here. Sent him into turn one, crashing in turn one. Yeah, that has to feel like an eternity. You're like, well, I will eventually hit something. You're just kind of crashing forever and waiting and waiting and waiting oh finally here's the wall let me hit it now that it, it's absurd so that happened you also had kyle bush apparently just got tired of uh, carson hosevar punted him off into turn one as well just carson hosevar to carson hosevar at least well i shouldn't say that because if he's going to carson hosevar he would have hooked him in the right rear and turned him head on into the wall didn't do that but you know carson certainly has had a history of doing that before, but they both rebounded, right? Finishing the top 10. Bubba Wallace got a huge run, or not a huge run necessarily, but tried to block a run down the backstretch, ends up wrecking himself. Second year in a row here at Texas where a run down the backstretch has cost him, um, you know, a shot at the win or an even better run than what he had. And he spins, he got he hits the 14 car, or the 14 hits him, and that corrected Bubba and actually honestly saved him and helped him out there a ton. They both rebounded, like I said, for top 10 finishes, which is great uh, for both of those drivers. And then you had Josh Berry involved in two spins. One of those, the first one, was a direct result of Ricky Stenhouse, who was not clear. Apparently his spotter and his uh, radio just don't work. And he decided to just, I'm going to turn left now. Good luck, everybody. And just turn left across the nose of the four car, Josh Berry. That upset his car. And then he went off and spun off into the corner and then eventually spun out again for that. Jimmy Johnson got the day started in stage one with uh, another spin because he just wants to spice things up a little bit. I'll say this. Like a decade ago, Jimmy Johnson was part of that like anti like um, don't say bossy campaign where like they don't want to call girls bossy or whatever. Jimmy Johnson's getting bossed around by every track that he's going to. This next-gen car is bossing Jimmy Johnson around every single week. Uh, he went and cosplayed as an IndyCar driver for a little while, and he constantly is bringing out one or two cautions a race on road courses. On ovals, he's actually really good. But on the road courses and street courses, you could always you could bet I, you could bet your mortgage on Jimmy Johnson bringing out a caution. You can do the same thing now. I constantly, dude's constantly being involved in other people's wrecks or like on Sunday spending himself out so he spins out manages to collect the car doesn't hit anything it was the second wreck of the weekend rebounds for his first lead lap finish in the gen 7 car 29th but hey it's a lead lap finish he finished 29th out of 38 cars 
So that's unfortunate. His spin, though, resulted in Alex Bowman spinning as he checked up, which resulted in the 42 car of John Hunter Nemechek also spinning. And then he he clobbered. I almost said a bad word right there. Uh, he all, he clobbered the 48 car like he was at a UFC fight this weekend. If I knew more about UFC, I would say the fighters' names. I have no idea who they were, but you know the knockout I'm talking about. And man, did he just wallop the uh, 48 car there of Alex Bowman. Bowman finishes 37th. Unfortunate day for him. Michael McDowell going for the lead. He spins out racing Ross Chastain. Nothing that Ross did wrong. Um, so there was another accident. What else have I missed today? Ricky Spinhouse spun himself out. Kyle Larson lost a wheel. It just fell off uh, because apparently his lug nut or tire changer was absent on tire college day where they talked about tightening the lug nut down. It was a problem with the car, not necessarily that, but not ideal for him because he would have won this race probably going away. He had the fastest car there on Sunday. So that's unfortunate for him. He then spins out later in the race, collects the 71 of of uh, Zane Smith. Zane had a good run going as well up until that point. And then you have Denny Hamlin sending it on the outside of a restart. He ends up crashing, ruins his day. The 15 and the 21 then get into another wreck. At one point in this race, Harrison Burton was leading this race on speed. He had used pit strategy to get up to the front and then manages to go three wide and start leading the race. Of course, there was the obligatory Kim Burton cam, which we absolutely do not need. Uh, I, I cannot stand the Kim Burton cam right also Harrison Burton is very much a adult he is a grown man who's engaged to another adult we don't need to show his mom all the time we just don't I'm sorry and maybe she should like just not hang out on the pit box so she's going to be that nervous but man I get so tired of the Kim Burton cam and then of course on the last lap of the race we have the one in the 24 car tangling and again I don't think that the 24 did anything wrong there a lot of cautions whole lot of cautions the broadcast Again, left a little bit to be desired, which is unfortunate. At one point, you have the 45 of Tyler Reddick and the 11 of Denny Hamlin racing for what will be the eventual lead, but it was like for 15th place on track. And Fox just m missed it. Just didn't even go to it like until three laps later. And Clint Boyer comes over and he was like, this was big. This was big and we missed it for you. C Clint, I don't think they want you admitting that. Because they're already getting roasted on the internet. They don't need you also doing that. I also think that the dynamic between Clint Boyer and Kevin Harvick in the booth just isn't working. It, it doesn't work. Uh, their jokes just aren't jokes. They almost seem mean-spirited at times. I'm a person that loves a good mean joke. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of the jokes are just kind of like Kevin being like, Haha, Clint, I won 60 races. You won 10 in your career. That sucks. Like, what? What? It's bad. I, the dynamic just doesn't seem to be working. I think Fox does. I think Harvick's good in the booth. I just don't think the dynamic with he and Boyer works out well at all. And Harvick's constantly like insinuating that Clint's drunk or hungover. And again, the joke I think has run its course at this point. I think Clint Boyer is enough of a professional to not show up hungover uh, to the broadcast booth. But man, yeah, that's just not working. The booth missed the five in the eighty-four. Kyle Larson. Jimmy Johnson, they were door banging down the backstretch, and all we got was an onboard shot. Super frustrating. Maybe they didn't have a wide angle shot of it, but you got to show that if you have it. The 12 car of Ryan Blaney getting punted, we just basically missed that. Thankfully, NASCAR's social media accounts posted the onboard of the 41 of Ryan Priest punting him. Same thing with the Kyle Bush Carson Hosevar incident. Didn't really get a good replay of that from Fox. Had to go back and watch the onboard uh, from NASCAR social as well. It's just things like that. Provide context to the viewer. Other than that, like, I mean, it's standard Fox. I, I, I don't think, we're not getting rid of the cartoons, so we're just going to stop talking about the cartoons. Um, it's just things, I, I think that Fox could be a really good broadcast if they just made some tweaks here and there. And not that it's a bad broadcast by, you know, any sort of the imagination. Like, we certainly have seen worse broadcasts than other sports. It's just like these little things that you're just like man like we need more context here we need a booth that isn't constantly trying to crack jokes all the time and like just present the race appropriately so that's my biggest complaint from that outside of it though entertaining race was it a good race though and that's kind of the biggest question here a race can be entertaining but not good and i think that's what happened this week i think that the race was entertaining but the racing wasn't good and a lot of people were talking about how great this race was. Oh, it was the best Texas race I've seen in years. It was the best Texas race you saw in years because you like restarts and you like Chase Elliott. 
and Denny Hamlin probably wrecked. Outside of that, though, the passing just isn't there because, again, the track is just not wide enough, really, to do any sort of passing. And it's unfortunate. And hopefully that's something that can get rectified, whether it's a reconfigure of the track or, well, really just a reconfigure of the track is going to help out the most because you're kind of limited on where you can run. Of course, now the biggest question is, like, do they reconfigure the track? I don't know at this point. Texas has become a wild card. It's a lot like a plate race, essentially. It, not without the big crash, but it's unpredictable. It's really unpredictable. At least like the last three there have been. And something weird always seems to happen at Texas. So from an entertaining standpoint, entertainment standpoint, it is enter- entertaining. So maybe we don't change it. Or maybe we do. But if you are going to change it, I think you just go back to the way it was. Narrow up one and two again, raise the banking back up, and make it symmetrical on both ends of the racetrack. SMI went through this real weird kick where they were like, you know what would make great racing if both ends of the racetrack were different? No, no, it's not going to make good racing. It makes really bad racing, in fact. We saw it at Kentucky. We saw it at Texas. Does not work. Do not do that again. A lot like what Denny Hamill was talking about, the reconfiguration record from SMI. It's bad. Don't do it. So if you're going to do it, do it that way. Don't do a short track. I saw Jordan Bianchi say that they should make it a three-quarter mile short track. No, don't do it. Richmond's already bad. We don't need another Richmond. Stop it. Every time people talk about short track, they're like, oh, you should make it three-quarter mile. Don't make it three-quarter mile. Don't do it. It's really bad. Stop. Stop thinking that you need to do that. The other thing that they could do, possibly maybe do, would be to do what everybody in Texas always does. Everything's bigger in Texas. Sky's bigger in Texas. Cinnamon rolls are bigger in Texas. Those big Tex ones. You know what I'm talking about. Make it a three-mile super speedway. Or like a 2.75 mile super speedway. Talladega is 2.66. Make it 2.7. I don't really care. But if you want to talk about doing everything bigger in Texas, make your racetrack the biggest one on the NASCAR Cup Series calendar right now. And outside of that, SMI doesn't have a true super speedway in its portfolio. So there's a perfect example of it. Do not do another Atlanta. I'm not even going to entertain that idea. I absolutely hate that idea. And I hope that they don't do it. All right. So Chase Elliott wins, moving on to the Xfinity Series race, which was entertaining. Again, race of the weekend. The Xfinity Series continues to be the best race uh, basically every single weekend uh, at this point. Sam Mayer ends up winning the race by two one-thousandths of a second over Ryan Sieg. Everybody wanted Ryan Sieg to win. No offense to Sam Mayer, no offense to Carolina Carports. Apparently the carport business is booming because they're sponsoring race cars now. But... It's got to be so heartbreaking for the Seags. They've grinded for so long to be in this position. And they run really well, right? They made the playoffs before. They continually like will run in the top 10 on speed. Like They definitely have speed in those cars. They're in position to win the race. Ryan Sieg leads the final 17 laps. Well, he led 17 of the last 18 laps. He put himself in position, gets up there, takes the lead of the race. This guy's going to win. You have cars on tires coming up, trying to catch them. That would be, you know, Allgaier. And doesn't get there. Sieg starts to get tight, talks about it. And then on the last lap, Mayer sends it into three and four and and won. Drag races him down uh, out of the corner, wins the race, and just a bummer for Ryan Sieg. Because I think we all want to see an underdog win. Um, it's always cool to see, especially for guys like that RSS, Rod Sieg, Ryan Sieg, they've been grinding forever. And Sieg after the race was basically just like, he just kept saying, sucks, it sucks, it sucks. And it does suck. It would have been cool to see. I, if if, Ryan Sieg's a super clean driver, right? He had had a run in with Ty Dillon, Ty Dillon, Ty Gibbs a few years ago. Um, but for the most part, dude races super clean. Hindsight 2020, if he goes back and looks at it, he probably wishes he would just put him in the wall. I think he has to think that at that point because if it was Mayer going for his first win, Mayer would have done the same thing, put him in the wall. So I think for Ryan, that's got to be such a bummer. But at least we're headed to Talladega this weekend. And he's going to have speed there. And you can hopefully maybe figure that out and maybe you know pick up his first win at... Um, at Talladega. But overall, the Xfinity race was a good race. Justin Allgaier, definitely the fastest car there, led 117 of the 200 laps. Like I said, Sieg led 17 of the last 18. And then you have um, 
Austin Hill, he led 25 laps, didn't ever really come back up. He finishes in sixth place. You also had Chandler Smith lead 26 laps. He got up out of the groove, and then his day was pretty much ruined from that point. Was it, did he get out of the groove, or did he have a loose tire? I don't know. Either way, I didn't take notes for this race. But it was, uh, overall, decent race. It was fine. It was acceptable. It was, uh, they can, the extended cars seem to race at Texas better than what the cup cars do. So I think that leads to, well, obviously a better race, but a more entertaining race. The actual racing is good. Where the cup race was entertaining because it was constantly like, what's going to happen next? It was like a horror movie where you're like, I don't know what the next thing is. And you're like, oh, that's what it is. Dang it. Did not expect that. The Xfinity race was more formulaic than that. And it was fine. But yeah, I thought the racing was a lot better in the Xfinity side which is maybe what the Cup Series needs to go back to, but we won't talk about that because the next-gen car is here to fix everything for us. Leland Honeyman, not a guy that should really be in this series. The uh, seven car of Justin Allgaier just drove through him to bring out the second caution of the day that the 42 was involved in. At the end of the day, though, it was perfectly acceptable race. Other than the finish, I don't know if anybody's going to remember anything from it, but the finish was all-time. However, I didn't see people going on the internet calling it the greatest race ever like they did for Atlanta in the Cup Series, which was different. Truck Series race on Friday night. Kyle Busch leads 112 of the 167 laps, wins the race, going away. Weirdest thing about this, it was the first win for Realtree in NASCAR as a primary sponsor. Absolutely wild that that is the, their first win as a primary sponsor. They've been on Dale Earnhardt's car. I believe they've been on Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s car. They've been on Kevin Harvick's car. Never once have they won a race as a primary sponsor until Friday night when Kyle Busch did it in the truck series. And when I think Realtree, when I th think Outdoorsman, I think Kyle Busch. I don't. Uh, it's like when Jamie McMurray is sponsored by Bass Pro. That was a very odd pairing. Or an 18-year-old Joey Logano sponsored by Home Depot. What? Corey Heim comes home second, Nick Sanchez third, Christian Eck is in fourth. Eck has had a lot of speed as well, led 31 laps. Uh, Nick Sanchez, again, had speed here just like he did last year. He leads 16 laps. I'll say it, man. Those, um, the Chevys, the Spire cars and the McAnally cars, the MHR cars, have trucks, trucks, trucks. Have so much speed. So much speed in them right now. Uh, McAnally had finished... Trucks finish fourth, fifth, and sixth. Eck is fourth, Zane Smith fifth, Daniel Dye and sixth. Shout out to Daniel Dye. He all but wrecked in the tri oval, quad oval, dog leg, whatever, going down the front stretch, going off into turn one. He was dead sideways, saved it, managed to hold on for a top 10 finish uh, for that team. Again, they have so much speed right now. Taylor Gray comes home seventh. Tanner Gray comes home eighth. Good run for Tanner Gray, especially after getting caught or wrecking. In practice, uh, he started 34th, finishes 8th. Stefan Parsons, 25th, Parsons, 25th to 9th. And Ty Majewski rounds out your top 10. Lawless Allen finished 11th. Um, so hats off to him. Uh, definitely use some strategy to get that done. But at the end of the day, it was uh, it was an entertaining race. One thing from it, two things from it real quick. First lap incident, Thad Moffitt goes up the racetrack, or I guess maybe second lap. Goes up the racetrack, uh, has the wheel cranked all the way to the left. Absolutely could not hold on to it. He ends up crashing. Uh, Memphis Villarreal gets caught up in it. So does Tyler Ankrum. Ends the day for all three of them. And then you have like a little over, what, three weeks ago, Chris Wright announced that he had signed a three-race three, re three race deal for Tricon Garage. At the time, I quote tweeted and said, hope the body shop is ready because this guy destroys trucks or cars quicker than anybody outside of Connor Mozak. And sure enough, wouldn't you believe it, on lap 151 or whatever it was, the one truck, sorry, yes, 150, 140, 146. The one truck wrecks again and destroys the truck and a bunch of other people in the process, the 02 and the 52, and brings out the caution. So at least this check clears, but the body shop over at Tricon, at least you have job security when Chris writes in your truck. Also, at one point, we had a caution come out during green flag pit stops. Zane Smith hits pit road, drives through, doesn't stop. Now, NASCAR has to figure out what the running order is. And it took forever. 
it honestly took forever. It was a 17 minute caution, I believe, is what it, I, I saw um, when I looked at the when the caution came out versus when they finally went back to green. This is electronically scored. We got to get better at figuring out what the running order is because you're just wasting laps out there and it looks a bit like a clown show, right? I was watching the race with somebody who knows nothing about racing and she's like, oh, did the yellow come back out again? She knows nothing. And I was like, oh no, this is the same one from before. Oh, that kind of kills the momentum. Yeah, it does. She knows nothing about racing. She knows a lot of things and just nothing about racing. So that was super frustrating um, at the end. But whatever. We'll move on. The broadcast was fine, I guess, for the most part. Oh, back to the Xfinity broadcast real quick. Ross Chastain was in the booth. Ross Chastain was phenomenal. He mentioned on the broadcast that Miss Pam on a flight convinced him to or planted the seat or whatever to get him to come on the broadcast. He's referring to Pam Miller from Fox. Um who's the producer for these races, absolute home run right there. Hopefully they get Ross back. I think that they will for future races on Fox FS1 with the Xfinity Series. But he was a natural. I know he said he was super nervous going in. It did not seem like it at all. Ross did his homework. He was super informative, gave great feedback, great analysis as well. Ross Chastain, if he wasn't such a good race car driver, I'd be like, put him in the booth right now because he was really, really good. So... Credit to everybody over there for making that decision and Ross for stepping up and doing it as well. So this weekend, we have ARCA, Xfinity, and Cup in Talladega. Hopefully the rain holds off there. You have IndyCar out at Long Beach as well as IMSA for the uh, Grand Prix at Long Beach. And you have Formula One, a sprint weekend in China, which means that the sprint race will happen on Friday night. I believe it is like 1130 or 1155 start time Friday night East Coast. Um, for for the sprint race, the race will happen at three o'clock in the morning, Saturday night, going into Sunday. So if you want to get up in the middle of the night to watch Max Verstappen win, you can do that. It's also Formula One's first race in China since 2019. Should be interesting uh, as we go forward. But Xfinity's off this weekend. Like and subscribe to the podcast. Um, subscribe to the podcast as well wherever you listen to that at. Like I said, I'll have the merch store up. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog.